Heavenly Father, we, we want to thank you again for this uh, wonderful journey we've had through the Gospels and Acts. Thank you for this glorious good news that Jesus died as our Savior and rose as our King. And thank you, Lord, for how it was your plan to see this good news preached to the very ends of, of the earth. And Lord, we pray as we uh, turn again to the book of Acts this evening and think about the theology of Acts, we pray that you'll give us a greater appreciation, understanding uh, of, of this important book. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to uh, be well equipped to teach it to others in the future. So we commit this session to you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're, we're looking at uh, the theology of Acts this evening. Uh, if you look in the, the outline that I sent you, there's probably about, uh, I don't know, about uh, 10 or 11 different, uh, different topics here that we, that we could talk about. I, I don't think we're going to get through all of them in, in, in great detail or anything like that. But uh, let's, let, let's say something about each of them. And, uh, and, and then some of them we'll probably dwell on in a little bit more uh, detail. So the first, uh, first topic to think about this evening is the topic of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And we've, we saw in, in Mark's gospel uh, that the kingdom of God was a massive theme in the book of, of Mark. Uh, and it's not surprising then that the theme of the kingdom, it, it then overflows into uh, books like Matthew and Luke uh, as well. And in Luke's gospel, uh, the kingdom of God is that phrase comes up many, many times. I think it, it's something like 40 times uh, that you find that, that phrase in the book of Luke. And that it shows you just how important that, that theme is to the book of Luke, that the phrase comes up so many times. But one of the interesting things when you get to the book of Acts is you don't find that phrase very many times. It only occurs eight times in the book of Acts. And so you might be tempted to think that then the it's not a very important theme uh, to, to Acts. But although the term is not very frequent, the concept is in fact prominent. Uh, the term appears at very significant points in the book, both at the beginning and the end. Um, and actually the concept is, is kind of there uh, throughout as well. So the first place that we find it is in Acts chapter, chapter one, verse three. Uh, Acts chapter one, uh, verse three. Let me share my screen. And here's the, the risen Jesus appearing to his disciples. Uh, and we read, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. And so he's died on the cross, he's risen again, and um, that has ushered in the, the kingdom. Uh, and now he's explaining all of this uh, during these 40 days before uh, the ascension. And uh, then he, he talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and the disciples, knowing their Old Testament, they understand that when there's resurrection, when the Spirit is going to be poured out, then that those are two big signals in the Old Testament that the kingdom of God is going to arrive. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, especially chapters 36 and 37, then it Chapter 36 talks about the pouring out of the spirit. Chapter 37, uh, uh, re the resurrection, the valley of dry bones and all of that. And so the disciples understand that the kingdom of God is about to dawn. And so it prompts their question there in verse 6. Lord, will you, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Um, and Jesus answers the question. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of, of the earth. And, and, and that is, as we saw last week, the kingdom is not going to arrive immediately. It's going to happen at the Father's appointed time. And the kingdom is not just going to be for Israel. It's going to be for the ends of the earth. The nations is going to be included. And we see the means by which the kingdom is going to be ushered in. It's as the disciples, empowered by the Holy Spirit, carry, um, bear witness to Jesus and his resurrection uh, to, to the ends uh, of the earth. And remember, we looked at the significance of this last week. Jerusalem, the capital city where God's king, his Christ reigns, 
uh, where God's presence dwells in the temple and so on, where the word of God goes forth. Judea and Samaria, Judea, the southern uh, kingdom, uh, Samaria, the northern, uh, the northern kingdom. Uh, and we saw that the gospel going to these places represented the fulfillment of uh, the reunification of Israel under the Messiah. And then the ends of the earth, we saw that that phrase is echoing Isaiah 49, 6. Uh, it's always God's plan that the gospel would go to the nations, uh, particularly through the ministry of the suffering servant, and that's going to be uh, going to be fulfilled. And, and we've seen that this verse is programmatic for the rest of the book of Acts. So therefore, we see actually the whole book of Acts then is about the kingdom of God being ushered in. Right as as first Jerusalem, Israel, the nations, as they're all brought under the rule of King Jesus, the kingdom of God is arriving. You see, so even even if the the term doesn't appear any more in the book, you can see that this these few verses cast the shadow of the kingdom across the rest uh, the rest of the book. Now, uh, sometimes we uh, the next uh, reference I think is in chapter eight and verse uh, twelve. And uh, here we see as Philip, as he is uh, preaching the gospel to the Samaritans, he is preaching the kingdom, right? So we read verse 12, when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Remember, that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus was going about preaching the gospel. He was preaching about the kingdom. And that's exactly what uh, what what Philip is doing. And so as throughout Acts, uh, as the gospel is preached, as you know, as Peter and Philip and Paul and the other uh, the other preachers in Acts, as they declare that you know Jesus is Lord and Christ, as they call on people to repent, they might not use the language of the kingdom of God, you see, explicitly. But as they're preaching that Christ is king and you need to repent and turn to him, it's equivalent, you see, to, to preaching the kingdom of God and calling people to enter because Jesus is the king. So if you're preaching Christ, Christ is king, then you're preaching uh, preaching the kingdom. So it's just one example of this. If remember in Pentecost, uh, Peter's, Peter's sermon, his conclusion at the end, Know for certain God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus is king. Okay, the next uh, next place we find uh, this language of the kingdom is in chapter 14, verse 21 and 22. And this is Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, and he has uh, faced fierce opposition uh, from uh, the Jews who just stoned him in Iconium. And as he comes to the end of the first missionary journey, he goes back to strengthen all these churches that he has planted. And we read in verse 21, uh, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, right? And uh, and so we can see we can see here how uh, being a faithful disciple and trusting Jesus to the end it's about entering the kingdom being being there on that last day as King Jesus is revealed and we are brought uh, we are brought in with him. Now the next the next place we find is in Acts chapter twenty and verse uh, twenty four. And again, this is a significant point in Acts. This is uh, the end of. Uh, uh, this is uh, in chapter 20. This is Paul's farewell address to the Ephesian elders just before he goes to Jerusalem to be uh, where he is going to be arrested and brought on trial and so on. So it's kind of this is the closing really of his missionary efforts. He begins in chapter 13, he ends in chapter 20, and chapter 20 here he's kind of summarizing. The, the, the nature of his mission, missionary endeavors and looking forward to his, his arrest. Uh, and so look how he, he summarizes uh, his, his message here. And let's look at verse uh, 24. He says, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of, 
of the grace of God. I think that is such a marvelous, uh, you know, mission statement that we could have for our life. You know, we say, look, the only thing that really matters to me, the only thing that's of true value in my in my life, it's not myself, it's not it's not even my family or my ministry or the thing that really matters to me. So I can testify to the gospel of the grace of God. But then verse 25, now behold, I know that none of you of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. So if you see uh, side by side there, verse 24, it says his ministry has been about testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. And then verse 25, he says he's been proclaiming the kingdom because to preach the gospel of the grace of God is to to preach the kingdom you see right um, because if you are proclaiming that you know in uh, in Christ the resurrected Christ who died for us and rose again that there is salvation and eternal life then you are proclaiming the kingdom and this is used to sum up Paul's whole ministry to this uh, point in relation to the kingdom of, of God. Uh, and then uh, we come towards the, the end of the book in chapter 28. Uh, and so we read, uh, there's, a, there's a cluster of references to the kingdom at the end, just as there was uh, at the start. Uh, so again, look how uh, Paul's ministry is summarized in chapter 28 and verse 23. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers, from morning till evening, he expounded to them, uh, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. So, and you can see the, the summary of Paul's ministry here. He's testifying to the kingdom. And especially what he's saying is that Jesus is the promised Christ. He's the promised um, Messiah. Uh, and this kind of links us uh, uh, back to, to, to where the, the book uh, begins, because I uh, notice here he's, he's directing this uh, to, to the Jews. Uh, he's sharing his hopes as an Israelite, the hope of Israel, and it's related to the, to the dawning of the kingdom. And that's, that was the question at the start. When will the kingdom be restored to Israel, but as the book ends, as Acts ends, we see that the Jews are rejecting the gospel. They're not entering the kingdom, which leads Paul to turn again to the, to the Gentiles, which he does in verses 24 to 28. Therefore, let it be known to you, this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And that brings us to the, the, the final summary verse of the book. And notice again how the kingdom of God is there too. He lived there two whole years at his own expense. He welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And notice once again, Paul's ministry, it's summarized in terms of proclaiming the kingdom of God. And that's linked to teaching people about the Lord Jesus Christ, the King Jesus, right? And so what you can see here is actually, yeah, the, the term kingdom of God, it doesn't appear a huge number of times, but it, there's a cluster at the beginning. It's a cluster at the end. It occurs in some really significant uh, places. And so we're to understand, actually, as the gospel is preached throughout the book, right, um, that the kingdom is being preached, right, the declaration of Christ's kingship implies that as you receive the gospel you enter the kingdom now i think this is significant actually for for our own for our own ministry so if you think of the ways today that we seek to uh, preach the gospel to other people i mean i guess our go-to place would be to say that uh, you know god loves you god wants to god wants to bless you jesus died for you so that you can be you can be forgiven, you can be made right with God, and, and, and so on. And, and of course, those are, those are true things. God certainly loves us so much. He sent his son and he pours out his forgiveness and all those things. They're wonderfully true things. But do you notice how so often in our own preaching of the gospel, we don't talk about the kingship of Jesus? 
We don't say Jesus Christ is Lord. You need to leave behind your old life. You need to leave behind your old gods. You need to submit to Jesus as the Lord of your life. But consistently throughout the book of Acts, that's how you see the gospel presented. How do they preach the gospel? By declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord, and therefore you need to repent um, and, and, and turn to him. And so I think this is, uh, this is something we need to keep in mind as we are seeking to share the gospel with others. Make sure you don't leave out the kingship of Jesus too, because to preach the gospel is ultimately to preach the kingdom. Okay, I, th I think that's enough on that. Would, would you like to ask any questions or we can move on? All right, well, let's, let's turn then to uh, thinking about uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I think there's a, this is probably a, one of the more contentious uh, uh, things in the book of Acts. A lot of, uh, there's a lot of discussions, especially related to kind of charismatic Pentecostal theology uh, around, surrounds, you know, the, the Holy Spirit in the book of, of, of Acts. So uh, this is probably a very good opportunity for us to just step back and let's have a look at the scriptures again and think, well, what, what is Acts actually telling us about the Holy Spirit here? Yeah. So let's go back to the beginning and we'll go a journey, another journey through and see what we, we learn about the Spirit in Acts. Firstly, uh, of course, the Spirit is very important, and he's, he's introduced uh, very early on, isn't he? Uh, we've seen the risen Jesus appears. He tells his disciples about the kingdom. And the very next thing, he promises the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, while they were staying with him, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. He's talking about the, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days uh, from now. So the first thing we, we see here is that there is, uh, there's two kinds of baptisms, right? There is a baptism with water, that was John's baptism. And then there is the, the baptism uh, with, uh, with the Holy Spirit. And uh, remember in, uh, in, in, in the scriptures, the, the water baptism is meant to be an outward and visible sign of the, you know, the, the real spiritual reality, which is the baptism uh, of, uh, of the Holy Spirit. So we have a promise, and of course it was first uh, promised uh, by, uh, by John, the, uh, John the Baptist spoke of it. Jesus repeats it here at the beginning of, of Acts. And then in verse uh, 7, we're told, uh, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the Spirit is going to be the one who empowers them uh, for their mission uh, to, uh, to the nations. So uh, let's, let's think then a little bit more about what, this, uh, what is this water baptism and what is this, this uh, Spirit baptism. So let's uh, go back to, to Luke's gospel in order to, uh, to do this in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 3. So remember there was uh, John the Baptist was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what water baptism symbolizes. Repentance, forgiveness. Right? Repentance, uh, turning from sin to live a new life that is uh, regeneration or rebirth as you go under the water it's a picture of you being dead and buried buried in the ground right as you come out of the water it's a picture of of, of resurrection rising again to new life baptism is a picture of repentance old life is done you've got a new life and forgiveness right because of course water symbolizes the the washing away uh, of of sin so as you repent as you turn from your old life turn back to god then you receive uh, the forgiveness uh, of, of your sins. And this baptism was an issue. It was offered to all of, uh, all of Israel. And Christ partook of it as he, partook, as he identified uh, as the, with Israel as the true Israel. Uh, and, but, of course, John also explained that we need more than just outward 
washing and cleansing. Right? We actually need our hearts to be changed. And so he talked about the, the baptism of, of the Holy Spirit. He said, uh, he says, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he's talking about Christ, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that was the, uh, you know, at his own baptism, as Jesus was baptized with water, we saw that he was also baptized with the Holy Spirit as the Spirit descended on him as a dove and identified him uh, as the Christ and as the serpent. So we see this, this promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is then uh, fulfilled in Acts chapter uh, 2, as the Spirit is, is poured out uh, at, at Pentecost. And uh, we see uh, that as the Spirit is being poured out, it's accompanied by these various things. First, there's the, the, uh, the wind. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing uh, wind, it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And remember the, the word for spirit, pneumatos, right? It can mean wind, breath, or spirit, depending on the context that you're in. Um, so this sound like a mighty rushing wind, this is, it symbolizes the Holy Spirit's coming. Uh, and, and then it divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. They looked like fires, and maybe not fire itself, but remember, in the Old Testament, fire symbolizes the, the presence of God. God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. He led Israel through the wilderness in a pillar of fire. He descended upon Mount Sinai in burning, burning fire. And so as the fire rests on, uh, on each one of them, it's a picture of God's presence coming upon uh, his, each one of his disciples. We're meant to understand that they've received um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then we have the languages, right? They, uh, we, we read in verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this is the only place in the Bible that we have this activity of speaking in tongues described. Remember the word tongues, it just means a, a language, right? Um, and we see here that they're actually intelligible human languages, right? Uh, so uh, we read on, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At this sound, the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we, we hear each one of us in his own native language? language and the word for language here is the greek word dialectos from which we get the english word dialect we like to talk in malaysia about all the different chinese dialects you know like mandarin cantonese whatever that's the word that's used here it comes it comes from here dialect means a uh, a language and so in other words the apostles here they're speaking real languages I think often uh, we think that speaking in tongues is some kind of unintelligible language. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, Paul talks about hypothetically if someone could speak in the language of angels, and so people assume that speaking in tongues must be some kind of uh, angelic language or, or, or something like that. But it's interesting, I think, in the book of Acts here, speaking in tongues is, is not speaking in babbling. It, it's not... You know, is speaking in real, intelligible human languages that people can understand. Now, of course, it's a miraculous activity because, you know, did Peter and the other apostles learn these languages? No, they didn't. They just suddenly started speaking them, right? So it's 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 miraculous, um, but it's not. Uh, but they're but they're real. They're real languages here, and I think that uh, that should give us some. Some caution, I guess, when uh, we're thinking about what people call speaking in tongues today. Is it the same activity today as what we what we're actually seeing here in in Acts, or it actually is something else really going on there? Um, I think that's an important important question. Um, but the real significance of the miracle can be seen in the fact that these people are from every nation under heaven. And I think uh, 
uh, it's helpful to look at a map at this point and we can get a hold of this. So you see here, these are all the different different places that are mentioned here in Acts chapter two. Uh, and some are near and some are far, but they're kind of from every corner of the, the compass, right? People have they've, they've come from all over the world. Now they're all Jews, right? But in a sense, they're representative of, of, of all the nations. And so this Pentecost is, is, is always being presented as a reversal of, of Babel. Remember in, in, Acts, in Genesis chapter 11, uh, humanity gathers together uh, in arrogant rebellion against God to build this tower to the heavens. Uh, and, and then God is angry and he changes their languages, confuses their languages in order to scatter them uh, uh, across, across the globe. Uh, well, now we have something uh, similar like that here. They gathered together, okay? But now Babel is overcome. Right? That the languages can be understood. Now it's not a permanent thing. I think this is only a maybe a foretaste of what heaven is is going to be like. I take it that Babel is ultimately only going to be overcome fully in in heaven. I don't know how it will be. Will it be that we will all understand every single language, or will there only be one language, a common language we can all speak? I don't know, right? Um, but that's where it's ultimately going to be. Uh, going to be fulfilled but there's a foretaste uh, there's a foretaste of it um, happening here uh, and that's the that's really the true significance of of Pentecost it's it's not so much about the the, the the charismatic gifts themselves but here is God's spirit enabling his people to to bear witness to him and to bear witness indeed to to all of of the nations that's what they say in verse 11 they're amazed they say we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of god the spirit is enabling them to preach uh, to preach the gospel uh, and then we were given an example of that with with peter who then uh, stands up and boldly proclaims the gospel remember peter in the gospel of luke he is uh He's ignorant, he's confused, he wants to do the right thing, but he doesn't. He, he, he denies Jesus three times and all of that. Right? But now here is Peter boldly proclaiming the truth. And it's the spirit of God that is enabling him uh, to, uh, to do that. So what's the significance of the coming of the spirit here? Right? Because this is a, a major turning point. Uh, in history, uh, but to to really fully un comprehend the significance of the Spirit being poured out at Pentecost, we need to go back to the Old Testament, and that's what Peter does here in his uh, his sermon. And the first thing that we see here is that essentially what it means is that the new age has come. The new age has has come. So as he begins his sermon, he takes them back to the prophet. Uh, Joel. Right? Let's pick it up from verse uh, uh, 16. It says, uh, we're not drunk, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. They shall prophesy I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be, shall be saved. So the coming of the Spirit, it indicates that the new age of salvation has dawned, right? The last days have arrived and in those last days we can all have god's spirit we can all truly know him because remember in the old testament god's spirit only comes on specific people for limited periods of time but the old testament looked forward to the day when god's spirit would be poured out on all flesh everyone would be able to make uh, know him and make him known whether you were old or young or rich or poor male or female 
We can all personally know him and make him known. And I think that's what's going on here when it talks about the, the prophecy and visions and dreams and so on. These were the things that would happen to the Old Testament prophets, you see. God would reveal his word to them and then they would make it known to the people. But now he's saying, what, that, what this prophecy is saying is in the last days, everyone will be able to do this. Everyone will have God's revelation. Everyone will be able to bring God's word uh, to his people. Because in the end, that's what prophecy is. Right? Prophecy is simply speaking God's word to God's people. And of course, in the Old Testament, some of the prophecies were about the future, but not much of it, really. A lot of the prophecies was interpreting what has happened in the past and encouraging them to live rightly in the, uh, in, in, in the present. Uh, and it, it reminds us that prophecy is not to be conceived of as something that is separate from the Bible, but actually prophecy is what happens as we speak about Christ from the word of God. That's what Peter is doing here. He's prophesying. The Spirit is enabling him to do it. Um, and that's, we're told here, in the last days, this is what we all will be able to do. The Spirit of God will enable each and every Christian to, to boldly preach the gospel uh, to, uh, to, to others. Right? So uh, the second point we see here is that then now is the time to repent because the coming of the spirit it's a gift but it's also a warning as well because it means that we've entered into the last days and the last days remember is the days of of judgment right so there's a need for every person to turn to jesus uh that's the picture we have here in verses 19 and 20 the day of the lord it was the judgment day uh and therefore we need to call on the name of the lord and be saved. And that's essentially what Peter does in the rest of this sermon. He explains that Jesus is the risen, the risen Lord who fulfills Psalm 16, who fulfills that prophecy to David in 2 Samuel 7, fulfills the prophecy in Psalm 110, uh, and then he comes to his conclusion that all the house of Israel therefore know for certain God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have uh, crucified. So here we, we learn another key truth about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. Right? Remember the crowds, they ask, what's the meaning of all these miraculous languages? And Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he talks about Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, do you see? The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus as Lord. He works in our hearts so that we receive him as Lord. And then he takes up his dwelling in our hearts that we may then boldly proclaim his lordship uh, to, to others. So how do we receive the holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit or the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, Peter tells us here at the end of the sermon. They said, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you, for your children, for all who are far off, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So as you turn to Jesus in repentance, leaving that old life behind, turning to him as Savior and Lord, and therefore receiving his forgiveness and having that symbolized uh, with uh, water baptism, then you received God's gift. Of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit by becoming a Christian. You're baptized with the Holy Spirit by uh, turning to Jesus Christ as, uh, as your Lord. And of course, if the Holy Spirit wasn't at work in your heart, that's not something that you would be able to do. And notice how this promise is, is it's very universal, isn't it? Right? It, the promise is for you, your children, all who are far off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. It's, it's really emphasizing, isn't it, that this promise of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for all people. Now, this is important. Why? Uh, because we're about to talk about this second blessing theology that you'll find in some uh, charismatic uh, circles today. Uh, and 
what is taught there is that it's a two-stage process. Right? You become a Christian, you receive water baptism at the start, and then sometimes subsequent to that, certain Christians, not all Christians, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues, and enables them to live a, a powerful, victorious uh, Christian life, right? It's a kind of a th theology that you'll find, for example, in Alpha Forces, right? You have the first part to become Christian, and the second part, the Holy Spirit weekend, where they hope that you will be baptized with the Spirit and speak in tongues, uh, and, and so on. Uh, that's not the pattern that we have set forward here in Acts chapter 2. You hear the gospel, you respond in repentance, and you, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's universally available, and it's given to all people at their conversion. Yeah. Now, you might ask them, well, where does the second uh, blessing theology come from? And, of course, it's because there are these odd repeats of Pentecost that happen three times uh, further on in the book of, of Acts. So let's look at each of these uh, uh, one by one. So the first one of these we see is in Acts chapter 8, verses uh, 14 to 16. And this is as the gospel goes to uh, the Samaritans for the first time. So let's come to chapter 8, verse 14. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So it's a rather odd little situation here, isn't it? The Samaritans have become Christians. They've received the water baptism as expressing that, but they haven't yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That only happens after Peter and John, two of the key apostles in the church, come, personally lay their hands on them, uh, and then they receive uh, the Holy Spirit. It, you know, this looks like two-stage process, isn't it? It seems like second blessing um, theology now it doesn't say that they spoke in in tongues at this point but presumably that's that's what happened here that's how they knew the spirit had fallen on them uh, so we might consider though why why might it be necessary for peter and john to witness the samaritans receiving uh, the holy spirit what why couldn't the holy spirit have just come as Philip preached the gospel and baptized them? Why do they have to wait for the apostles to come? So one of, the, one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we're reading the book of Acts is we've got to ask, is this prescriptive or is this descriptive? As in, is this prescriptive? Is this a pattern that we are to expect to happen in the lives of all subsequent believers? Or is this descriptive is this talking about something that is specific and unique something that happened but won't necessarily always happen um, to every single believer and, and it seems to me like in, in the, pre, the prescriptive pattern seems to be given in acts 2 right where peter was saying you know this is for you it's for your children or who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That, that, that sounds prescriptive to me. He's, he's saying, look, this is what's going to happen throughout all generations and all places. This is, this is what you are, to, you, you are to expect. But here it seems to be something unique because here we have the gospel going to the Samaritans for the very first time. Now, we need to remember the Jews hated the Samaritans, right? The Samaritans were half bloods in terms of their um, their race. They were half, you know, the half bloods in terms of their religion as well. Because when the Northern Kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians, because of their idolatry, the Assyrians mixed the peoples together so that they'd lose their national identity and therefore they wouldn't rebel against the Assyrians. So the Samaritans in the north were a mixed race. They weren't pure Jews. And in fact, the whole reason they went into exile in the first place was because of their idolatry, because Jeroboam, the first king, he didn't want the people of 
in the north going down to the temple in Jerusalem. So he created his own high places. He created his own priests, created his own festivals. He even had his own version of the Old Testament called the Samaritan Pentateuch, which was only the first five books of the Bible and, and ignored all of the rest of them because he didn't want all that stuff about the temple and people going up to Jerusalem. So it was a, it was a corruption of Old Testament religion. Uh, and that's why when the southern kingdom eventually came back and rebuilt the temple, they didn't want the Samaritans to have any part in rebuilding the temple. In fact, the people in the north opposed the Jews as they tried to rebuild the temple. So that's why it's so shocking in Jesus' parable when, uh, you know, it's the Samaritan uh, who, who, you know, the parable of the good Samaritan. It's, it's not the priest that helps the, the person who's been beaten up. It's the Samaritan who does it. It's shocking. Um, or you've got the lepers, 10 lepers, only one comes back, and the one who comes back is a Samaritan. It's so shocking uh, because the Jews despised the Samaritans. They didn't consider them to be God's people in any, uh, in, in, in any way. So you might ask then, what would it take to convince a Jew, a Jewish Christian, that the Samaritans can be part of the people of God. Well, it's going to take something like this, isn't it? As Peter and John, the head apostles, they see with their own eyes that exactly what happened to them at the beginning at Pentecost is now happening to the Samaritans. It's a repeat of Pentecost. And it's unusual because it is emphasizing that the Samaritans are in. The Samaritans are accepted. The Samaritans are part of the kingdom, uh, part of the kingdom of, uh, of, of God. Now, one of the ways we know that this is not prescriptive is just by comparing it to some of the other, uh, the other examples of this. So the second one that we will look at now is, uh, is in chapter 10. And in chapter 10 now, this is as the gospel is now going to the Gentiles for the first time. So this is the conversion of, of Cornelius. And we're looking at chapter 10 and verse 44. Uh, remember, it takes a lot of effort for God to get Peter to go to, to Cornelius. He has that vision about, you know, the, all these unclean animals coming down in a sheet. And God says, go and eat them. And Peter says, I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And God says, don't call unclean what I have made clean. Right? And eventually, as Cornelius' servants turn up the doorstep, I think he starts to understand that it's not just about the food, um, but the Jews considered the Gentiles to be unclean. The Jews weren't allowed to eat with the Gentiles. It was prohibited and so on. But now Peter goes. Uh, he goes to Cornelius' house starts preaching the message to them. And then verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised who come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing and speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we had, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice here the order is reversed, right? With the Samaritans, they hear the gospel, they are baptized with water first, and then they receive the Holy Spirit later. This is the opposite. They receive the Holy Spirit before Peter's even finished his sermon. And uh, witnessing this, Peter, Peter then gives the, uh, the water baptism. So neither of them can be prescriptive because the the order of the events is reversed uh, in, uh, in, in the two occasions. But uh, and then Peter reflects on this in the, in the next chapter because the people are all rather upset that Peter has gone and, uh, and, and, and eaten with, uh, with, with the Gentiles. You can see what they're, what they're saying. Uh, the apostles, the brothers who were throughout Judea, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Because Jews are not meant to eat with Gentiles. And Peter you know, recounts the whole of chapter 10, all in summary form. And 
Then his conclusion in verse, uh, uh, verse 17 here. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And they heard these things that fell silent, they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads uh, to life. Uh, so do you, see, uh, do you see the point here? Right? The, the repeat of Pentecost with the Gentiles then is emphasizing that they're also into right? They're also accepted as God's people. But it's not a prescriptive event. It's not that every time that someone becomes a Christian that, you know, there's going to be, you know, speaking in tongues happening and, you know, no, it's not, that's not the point of, of, of what's going on here. In fact, there are lots of times uh, when, when that doesn't happen. So, for example, if we were to go back to, I know the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch in chapter 8. Philip, Philip goes to him, preaches gospel to him, and he gets baptized um, with water. But there's, there's no mention of him uh, you know, speaking in tongues or, or any, anything miraculous like, like that happening here. And that's that that that's normal. That that's the normal thing, the normal pattern that you see throughout the Book of Acts. There's only these three repeats of Pentecost where you have the tongues and the whole, you know, the whole thing. Uh, the rest of the the rest of the times it's just quite quite normal. Now the last uh, one just for completion here is in, in Acts chapter 19, and uh, this is uh, one of my favorite stories I think in the Book of, of Acts. Uh, Paul encounters these disciples in Ephesus. Uh, he's, and it's really odd. They're, they're, they're called some disciples. So remember, a disciple, that means a follower, right? a student. But if you're going to be a follower, you can't just be a follower, can you? you? You have to be a follower of something. But here they're just called disciples. They're followers. And so he wants to check, are these people Christians or not? He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because you can't be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit. They said, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so he asked the next question. Into what then were you baptized? Because if you're a real Christian, you will have been baptized. They said, into John's baptism. And then the penny drops. Okay, they've, uh, somehow they've, John the Baptist was preaching in the Jordan. They went over there. They got baptized with him. They went home and they, they never heard about Jesus. They never heard the gospel. They never became Christians. They they're kind of followers of John the Baptist or something like that. And so what does, uh, what does Paul do? Because they're clearly not Christians at this, this point. They haven't been converted yet. Well, he preaches the gospel to them, tells them about Jesus, and then he baptizes them in the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit falls upon them. They begin speaking in tongues. There was 12 men in, uh, 12 men in all. So, uh, again, the gospel is, is crossing a barrier here, and it's emphasizing that even those who receive John's baptism, they too need to be converted, and as they do, they are, they're, they're accepted as God's, as, as God's people, as evidenced by the giving uh, of, of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, a helpful thing when we're reading uh, the book of Acts or the gospels as well is if, we, if we're trying to draw some conclusion from Luke Acts, because it's narrative, it's always a bit uh, tricky to do so. It's always good to check your findings with the epistles, because the epistles is where you find what normative Christianity uh, is, is about, right? Uh, and so, you know, if you if you found that the New Testament epistles teaching about second blessing theology or something like that, then okay, then that would be something that would be more compelling. But of course, you don't find that there. Um, we, we find something different. So one passage that we could look at here is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, chapter 12. And uh, here Paul begins, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is a curse. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. In other words, 
What's the mark or the test of whether you have the Holy Spirit or not? What do you say about Jesus? You can't say Jesus is Lord and mean it unless it's the Spirit of God working in your life. And then verse 12, just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. You see the point there? All Christians have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When does it happen? It happens at your conversion. That's what Peter says at, uh, at, at Pentecost. So we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be led astray by this kind of second blessing theology, which, which, which does go around, suggesting that there is kind of two levels of Christians. There's the normal Christians, and there's the spirit-filled, powerful Christians who are able to prophesy and do miracles and all these things. I think there's a misunderstanding of what prophecy really is, the misunderstanding of what speaking in tongues is and the significance of it, and there's a misunderstanding of, of the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit. Um, and part, where does it all come from? It comes from taking things in Acts out of their context in the end and taking things that are descriptive and unique and making them apply to all Christians. It's easy to do. It's easy to come up with a proof text, but it doesn't mean that it's a faithful interpretation of what the Bible is saying. Okay, let me just pause there. I, you might have questions about that. Would you like to ask anything? Uh, Pastor, uh, Tim, um, beside confession, there are also other signs of the Spirit, uh, receiving of the Spirit for us. Um, that is actually, um, you know, some feels a spirit, some doesn't. Um, but the question, what would be the decisive one that, uh, beside the proclamations that Jesus is Lord for us? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I think it's not so much about what you feel. I mean, you yeah. may feel something, you may not. You may, you may feel peace and joy when you become a Christian. You, you, you may not you can't make uh feelings or emotions normative yeah. and say that you must have had these feelings for your conversion to be genuine you don't see that in the new testament at all so it's yeah as it is confessing jesus as lord but that then being expressed in your in your life because if you truly have the spirit of god then the spirit's going to bring forth the fruit of the spirit in your life so you're going to be growing in holiness, be growing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all those, all those things. You're going to be becoming more and more um, like Jesus. Um, that's ultimately going to be the mark of, of, of the Spirit work in your life. So in other words, it's, it's not so much about the, the particular gifts that you have or miracles that you perform, because if you look closely in the New Testament, then you can, you know, you uh, demons and false prophets and so on you can also do miracles so um, magicians and witches can tell you the future um, yeah. so you, you can't just point to you know to, to prophecy or a healing or miracle or something like that as an evidence that this must be from god no what do they say about jesus um, and then how is that reflected what's the fruit that comes from it in the life i think that's that's how we approach it. Okay. Um, I mean, the other thing is that, um, well, I think this leads on to maybe the next one that you're probably going to touch on, which is actually the baptisms uh, of the spirit itself, uh, which is how can we know or that the person is safe? Uh, it's not certainly not baptism of the water, but certainly it's actually... Um, how much uh, God is working in their lives, and then we be able to tell that He is safe, and He has received the Spirit, and He understands His Word, and is living that 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 the, the life that is changed by the Spirit. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So here, I guess remembering that 
uh, the promise that's being fulfilled at Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, it's a passage like Ezekiel 36. And uh, yeah. Ezekiel 36, remember, it talks about the changed heart, right? He says, yeah. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You'll be clean from all your uncleannesses, from all your idols. I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my, my rules. So in other words, as the spirit is poured out and comes to dwell in our hearts, our hearts is changed. Right? We're no longer having hearts as stubborn as stone like the Old Testament law, right? God's Old Testament people, but now soft hearts that want to obey him. Um, and you kind of see that in... Uh, in, in Acts 2, Acts chapter 2, the Spirit is poured out and the church is created. 3,000 people converted on that, that first day. And notice the fruit that is then expressed in it. Right? Uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread and prayers. All came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together. They had all things in common. They were selling the possessions and belongings and distributing the seeds to the poor. Uh, to all as any had need day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people, the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So you see there's this radical transformation in them, right? Uh, they love each other, essentially. They, they're, they're willing to sh share their possessions, whatever they have to help other people. That's not how people normally live. People keep their possessions for themselves. Yeah. We all know that. Um, but here's this radical generosity. And it's 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 not something that they're forced to do. They're doing this with this overflowing joy and, and, and praise to God. It's a privilege that they're they're doing. And then God uses that to add still more people to become Christians, because why are these people suddenly all so different to who they who, who they used to be? So that's the that's the spirit's work, you see. It's he brings us, he changes our hearts, he gives us the new birth so that we repent, turning to Jesus as Lord. We leave our old life behind, we turn to Jesus as Lord. And then as he dwells in our hearts, he brings forth his, his fruit and supremely the fruit of, of, of love. Yeah. And so that's going to be the mark of whether someone's truly a Christian. Yeah, I, I think it brought me in my, my difficulties is actually to know how it has changed a person because sometimes it may be only a very slow change in a very long period of time before it gets to be seen. Yeah. So that, that's the, the difficulties in, in actually identifying that. And there are some who are less changed and we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we have examples of like, like that even in the book of Acts itself. So, so for example, in Acts chapter 8, you have uh, Simon the magician who's, uh, you know, converted, right? And beforehand, right, they're all, he's doing magic. He's got the whole, he's captured the amazement of everyone in Samaria. They all paid attention from the least of the greatest, saying this man is the power of God that is called great. So they're treating him some kind of, of, of God is using his magic to serve his own importance and so on. Um, but then uh, we read in verse 30, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, seeing great signs and great miracles performed with his mates. So it says he literally he believed, he was baptized, right? Um, but then uh, after he witnesses the pouring out of the spirit on the Samaritans, which we just looked at, uh, he, he, he has a request. So now when Simon saw the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. Your heart is not right before God, repent therefore of this wickedness of yours. Pray to the Lord, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. I see that you're in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And look how pathetic his response. Come and answer, pray to me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon you. So 
he seems like he's a true believer, hmm. but his heart comes out in the end. You know, he still he still wants his own greatness. He still wants um, he, he still wants people to come to him. Um, yeah. he thinks he can buy buy off to get what he wants, and he says, "No, you have no part with us. Your heart's wrong, not right with God." So that's I guess that's the tricky, isn't it? So um, yeah. we can only go off what they say and, and and so on. But just because someone has been baptized with water or said, you know, I follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that their heart has been changed. And that will become clear all the time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions here? Okay, let's, let's read this last couple of quotes that we have in the handout then uh, to summarize the work of the Spirit. Because apart from these Pentecost experiences, the Spirit actually features prominently in Acts, is instrumental to the spread of the gospel. So Peterson writes this. Luke makes this point in various ways. The line of, of Ananias and Sapphira to the believing community is a sin against the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is instrumental in building and strengthening the church on a wide scale, enabling it to live in the fear of the Lord and go forth forward with encouragement or comfort the spirit endows and equips various individuals for ministry within and between the churches the spirit guides the jerusalem church to make a decision that will enable jews and gentiles to live and work together in the churches the spirit's work may therefore be assumed in summaries of church life and ministry such as chapter two chapter four turn to rightly acknowledges secondary missiological effects from these activities right so spirit is doing lots of stuff not just the uh not just this uh, repeats Pentecost. The spirit is given as much to create life in the kingdom, conversion, transformation, relationship building, as for the numerical growth of the kingdom through prophetic ministry and mission outreach. And then the last quote, in summary, the spirit fundamentally communicates the blessings of a relationship with God through faith in Christ. The spirit then works through those who have turned to the Lord Jesus, enabling them to communicate salvation to unbelievers and make disciples. Believing communities are established by the spirit in which gifted individuals minister to one another to edify the church and make it grow. Together with angels, heavenly voices and visions, the spirit initiates new phases of mission and oversees the direction of the mission. The spirit establishes and preserves unity between different racial and cultural groups in the church, providing guidance in important ecclesial and personal decisions. As the spirit imparts wisdom and knowledge of the risen Lord, he affects change in the life of believers on a communal as well as an individual uh, level. So uh, we don't have time really to flesh out all of that in detail, but I think just taking the, you know, the overall vibe of the thought there is that the spirit is active throughout the book of Acts, not just bringing conversion, but yeah, empowering sorry. people to boldly preach the gospel and then transforming lives as a result. Okay, so our, ne our next thing here, we're thinking about the progress of, of the word of of God, and of course, when we're we're talking about the uh, the word here, ultimately we're talking about the gospel itself, right? Uh, and uh, as we see here, Luke places great emphasis on the spread of the word of God, the gospel, through its constant proclamation as the means by which churches are planted, grow strong and reproduce. Luke is particularly interested in the way the word, by which he means the message of Christ, is preached, received, and grows in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Luke's emphasis is on the triumph of the word of God in the face of many difficulties and much uh, opposition. And it's clear then that the way that the gospel grows uh, is as it's boldly preached in the face of uh, persecution in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, I think that's Acts chapter 1, verse 8, isn't it? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will bear, be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I think what we see as we move through the book of Acts, that this 
and empowerment is not simply for doing miracles, although there are simply plenty, there are plenty of uh, spectacular miracles in Acts. Uh, but the Spirit is is actually empowering people for bold proclamation uh, of of the gospel. Uh, and perhaps here we could we could introduce a, a slight distinction in the Book of Acts between being baptized with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit is something that happens at your conversion, right? And it's something that happens to all believers and it only happens once, right? Whereas uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it seems, is something that can happen more than once, right? And usually this filling with the Holy Spirit is associated with the bold proclamation uh, of, of the gospel. So, if, so for example, uh, if we were looking at uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter is filled with the Spirit, and then what does he do? He gets up and he preaches boldly to the crowd and calls them, uh, calls them to repentance. Uh, we'll see another example in, in Acts chapters 3 and 4. Acts chapters three and four. So of course in Acts chapter three, we have this uh, lame beggar healed and then uh, Peter preaches uh, the name of Jesus uh, in, uh, in the temple and they get, a, they get arrested and they're charged in chapter four and verse, uh, chapter four and verse 18, not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and uh, John reply with great boldness to say whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and, and heard. So they say, look, no, we're going to go on preaching the gospel. You can't, you can't stop us. And as the chapter closes, we find out that the other believers have been praying praying for boldness uh, to preach, uh, preach the gospel. We'll pick it up here at verse 31. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, this, this, this is a subsequent to their conversion. They were already Christians at this point. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So, the filling with the spirit is empowering them for bold proclamation um, in the midst of, uh, of, of, of persecution. Okay. Uh, so we see another similar example of this in, in, in Acts chapter 12 of the unstoppable you know, progress of the word of God. Uh, beginning of the chapter, we have uh, James, the brother of John, is killed. And then Peter, the apostle, uh, arrested. And, of course, uh, Peter is miraculously uh, uh, rescued out, of, uh, out of, the, of, of the prison. And somewhat humorously, he, he knocks on the door of the people who are praying for him. And the girl, Rhoda, she's so happy that she forgets to open the door and leaves Peter st standing there out, uh, out, outside. So, again, Peter's... James loses his head, Peter is released, and the chapter ends with, uh, with Herod, who's done all this, uh, dying. They, 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 they praise him, saying, look, the voice of a God and not a man is struck down. And then the summary statement here, that the word of God increased and uh, multiplied. So the gospel continues to advance and advance and advance in the face of of opposition, persecution. I mean, it must have been looking pretty bad when James was dead and Peter was in prison. I mean, they were, the church was thinking the worst. But it continues to, to progress, continues to progress. I mean, Saul in chapters, chapters uh, 6 and 7 is going around with this vicious persecution of the church. It must have looked quite bad. Chapter 8, all the believers are scattered as they run away. Uh, trying to escape the persecution. But we're told here those who were scattered went about preaching 
the word. And that leads to the conversion of the Samaritans. There's much joy in the city. So you start the chapter 8, verse 1 starts here with there was a great persecution against the church led by Saul. And it ends, there's great joy in the city because they've, they've been converted. Uh, in the next chapter, we'll meet Paul himself, the vicious, you know, uh, breathing out threats and murder against the disciples, going house to house. Uh, to arrest the disciples, to throw them in prison. The greatest opponent of the church, he also can't stop the spread of the gospel as, as God turns this great persecutor into the great um, missionary uh, to the nations. So this is what we see again and uh, again and again uh, throughout the book of Acts. And we return to that table that we, that we looked at last week. And I remember we saw that uh, each each section of Acts it ends with this this summary statement about the Word of God uh, growing, the Word of God bearing fruit, um, and and so on. And if we were to look at you know Acts thirteen to twenty eight here, thinking about Paul's ministry, there's so much persecution, there's so much opposition. But of course, the book of Acts ends with the triumph of the Word of God. He lived there two years at his own expense. He welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God, teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. How does the gospel advance? It advances as it is boldly proclaimed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it does so without hindrance, even in the face of whatever uh, obstacles, opposition, persecution, difficulties um, that it might face. There is a big theme in the book of Acts, right? the unstoppable progress of the word. Right? But it's a good question to us then uh, for ourselves. Is our confidence in the word of God to convert people, to grow churches, to plant churches, and, and all of that? Because I take it that very often uh, if we start to lose confidence in the word of God, when we maybe we try to share the gospel with a neighbor or we put on some kind of evangelistic program and, you know, people don't respond or whatever, then we, we, we look for other ways to try and convert them. And we think, oh, you know, if uh, instead of preaching the gospel, let's, uh, let's do evangelism without words and let's just live good lives and or let's just have a nice good music or let's... Uh, you know, do something else. Maybe we have good social media or good community or something, and that will help people to become Christians. And so suddenly the, the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, the teaching of the word of God is no longer the central thing in the church anymore. We've lost confidence in the power of the word. And so other things start to crowd in and take its place. Luke wants us to see here the unstoppable power of the word of God, the word of God converts people, he plants churches, he grows churches. We should never stop uh, preaching the word. But it happens as we boldly preach the word in the face of, uh, of, of opposition. Okay, uh, any questions there? Um, probably this is just another opposition of what we don't understand so well of the book of Acts. Um, we tend to actually um, get swayed by persuasions or we try to use persuasions and we try to even um, uh, probably avoid the hard language of gospels that they must repent of their sins. Uh, I, I think that's uh, the kind of making it easy for them to come in. And then uh, uh, when they come in, then really they know the hard language. That's what we will try to do. Uh, so how would you be able to encourage one who actually has this and see from X what you are saying just now? Uh, so that they can be more convinced that, or even myself, 
that yes, the word is the authority, the word bold proclamation is the way to go that would convert people. Yeah. So I think, yeah, you see, we always see a divided response to the word. Yeah. Of Acts, right. So it's never, it's never all Acts 2. It's not, you know, Peter preaches and there's 3,000. Yeah. In one. yeah. It'd be lovely if it was always that. But of course it's not because next chapter 3, Peter and John is in from the prison because the, the, the Jews want them to shut up. Yeah. And you see these things happening again and again, say with Paul's ministry, some will listen, some won't, um, you know, and then inevitably there's some riot or gets thrown in prison or someone's unhappy and then he has to, to, to move on to the next place. But everywhere he preaches, it's both those things, the stubborn opposition and rejection. And, and there is also people um, uh, who, who believe. And, we, we see that right to the end of the book of Acts, right? So if we were to go to chapter 28 at, yeah. at the end, when Paul finally arrives um, in, in Yom, uh, so we, we see that there's a great, like they're interested to hear what he has to say. Right? Um, said, we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it's spoken against. When they have, had appointed a, a day for him, they came to him at lodging in greater numbers from morning to evening. He expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And notice the divided response. Some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And that leads to um, Paul saying that, you know, they're hard-hearted and he's going to go and turn um, instead um, to... To the Gentiles. So right to the very end, we have these uh, these divided responses. So yeah, I think uh, the gospel that someone is the gospel that you preach will determine ultimately whether they're converted. Right. Mm. So I mean, if you if you put on some kind of rally. And then the speaker comes up and says, oh, if you trust in Jesus, God's going to bless you and you'll experience amazing miracles in your life. And that's the quote-unquote gospel that is, is preached that day. Right? Yeah. You go up the front and you, you, know, you give your life to Jesus and you're slain by the Spirit, and whatever else happens to you that, that day. So you go away from there thinking that you're a Christian. You're probably not. Is Jesus Lord of your life? If you turned away from your old life to submit to him and obey him in every part of life, that was not the decision that was made. You just came to him to, to get some kind of blessing and power. And so what happens often then later on in life? Because you're not, you're not going to escape suffering for your entire life. It's going to become a point where the, you're going to face some kind of um, suffering. Right? Yeah. But if that's the gospel that you've been converted with, converted with god's going to bless you then when that doesn't come true in the future you're going to give up you're going to walk away you know? whereas if you have been converted with the with the, the, the true gospel has been preached jesus christ is lord repent and believe um yeah a lot of people is not going to be interested a lot of people is going to turn away a lot of people might be feeling offended or unhappy with it but those who do genuinely believe as the spirit works in their life they'll be actually converted and, and they'll they'll go on following jesus in, in, in long in the long term because they, the the conversion is genuine that they've submitted to jesus as, as, a, as the lord of their life and that's what makes someone a christian uh, reverend uh, i want to ask if those people we really uh, told them about the gospel and they rejected, so we do we just leave them alone or we do still persist on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question and it's an interesting one that comes up in Acts itself because you see uh, uh, the, uh, again and again, Paul, Paul preaches the gospel first to the Jews. They reject it and then he goes to the Gentiles. This happens again and again, right? 
So let's look at chapter uh, chapter 13 here. And so he preaches in city and Antioch. They reject his message. He says it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, have made us you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now you read that, and it sounds like Paul's done with the Jews, right? He's tried, didn't work, they rejected it, forget them. He's the apostle to the Gentiles anyway. Let's go and preach to else. Gentiles. But then you read on, just a couple of verses later, what does Paul then do? He goes on to the next city, to Iconium, and then at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue. <laughs> so they don't actually abandon the Jews at all. They, they, they go back into the, the synagogue again. Of course, the same thing repeats. Unbelieving Jews stir up the Gentiles, poison their minds against them, and then, you know, he's, he's, he's chased out to the next place and the next place the next place. So, yeah, so Paul says that their rejection means it's turning to the Gentiles, but then he keeps going to the Jews again and again um, and, and again. So, I, I mean, I, I take it that we don't, um, we don't ever give up on bringing the gospel to people, yeah? We recognize ultimately it takes God. God's spirit to change their hearts. And if God can transform someone like the Apostle Paul, then surely there is no one who is too far gone that he can't save them yeah um but if their hearts is hard-hearted it doesn't mean that you're just going to keep going again and again and again and again that's just going to make them more and more angry and embittered isn't it right so um yeah say say you're sharing with a relative or something like that you can't just keep going to them every single day you're going to believe in jesus today you can just make them so irritated and angry isn't it but over the course of your lifetime, you're still going to keep looking for opportunities and living the Christian life, trying to share with them. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, just want to clarify in terms of the, just now you mentioned the difference between uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit as well as being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes. So... Uh, in Corinthians, he said that the our, temp, our bodies is a temple of God and that the Spirit dwells within us. So <clears throat> I take it as when we receive the gospel, the Spirit dwells in, the, in us. Yes. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Correct. Uh, so if the Spirit is really in us, uh, then why does he still need to feel us to, to proclaim the word? Yeah, I think the, the, the idea of the, the, the filling here, maybe we could look at uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 5 as a bit of a cross-reference here to get a sense on what this language of filling means. So, and, and this is the only place where it's, it, the idea of being filled with the Spirit is really talked about in the epistles. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice it's a, it's a passive, it's something that happens to you. Be filled with the Spirit. It's an ongoing thing. It's not a one-off thing, but this is something that is to happen in an ongoing way. Uh, and then it's clarified, what does this mean? What does being filled with the Spirit mean? Well, it means addressing one another in psalms and hymns and songs, giving thanks to God. Um, submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ, you know, wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters, and, and, and so on and so forth. But it's contrasted here with don't be drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So it's the idea of being, uh, you know, in, in, intoxicated or um, something taking control of, of, of you. So when you yeah, when you are drunk with wine, then you, you start doing all kinds of, uh, you're possessed to do all kinds of crazy, crazy things, right? But this is kind of being <laughs> possessed or overcome, you know, in a good way. That is, mm -hmm. be, to be filled with the spirit means that the spirit is so um, controlling your heart and life that you're doing what 
God wants you to, to do, which includes things like boldly, boldly uh, proclaiming the gospel in the face of opposition. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the spirit is always in our hearts if we are Christians. It takes up residence in our hearts. But, um, uh, you know, we can yield more or less, I guess, to his um, influence or control um, over our life. And the language of feelings, I think, you know, getting at that. I'm probably going to ask a question that's opposite of what Jonathan is asking. How can we lose the spirit? I mean, can, can the spirit sort of weaken in us or leave us some part and that we need to be filled? Uh, as I said, the baptism of the spirit, no, that's a permanent, that's a permanent thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Ephesians 1 talks about the spirit being the deposit, the seal of what is to, is, is to come. In the Old Testament, Saul loses the spirit, but that's different. It's Old Testament times. The spirit comes upon you for temporary periods, specific people to empower them for their jobs, specific tasks. But yeah. no, in the New Testament, it's 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 a it's a permanent thing. The spirit is always with us. If you don't have the spirit of God, you're not a Christian. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the spirit keeps you Christian. Okay, so yeah. that part I, I understand, but what I was trying to go towards too is that would you actually get weaker in the spirit and then you need to be filled up again? That's probably more my question. Yeah, well, I think this verse we just read talks about is that there's a command to keep being filled with the spirit. And yeah, it's, it's something that it, you know, even in Acts, it happens more than once to the same, same people like Peter, for example. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, we want to be continually yielding to the control of the spirit over our life. And how does that happen, by the way? It's through the word of God, isn't it? I mean, the spirit, what does the spirit do? It works in people's hearts to, so that the, the word about Christ is preached, right? Mm -hmm. And ultimately written down in the scriptures, scriptures yeah. for us so that we can speak it to one another. And so it's a how is it that the spirit is going to increasingly control our hearts and lives? It says his word is, 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 is preached to us and we believe it and we begin to live it out. So it's not something, I mean, it's, it's supernatural, but it's not, it, it can be ordinary, it's spectacularly ordinary. I, I don't know, something like that. Supernaturally ordinary. Um, the spirit works ordinarily through the word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, I think let's uh, let's move on, and let's think about a little bit about the apostle Paul. Uh, so one of the interesting things about Acts is that uh, it's really a book about two places and two main people. I don't know if you've you've realized that, right? Essentially, the book of Acts is about the gospel going from Jerusalem to Rome. And the first half of the book, we're all about Peter. First 12 chapters, lots of stuff about Peter. Not only about Peter, but mainly about Peter. And then chapters 13 to 28, it's pretty much about Paul. Yeah, you know, Barnabas, Timothy, and a few other guys there, Paulus as well. But it's mainly about Paul. And we see that, uh, you know, God uses Peter initially in terms of bringing the gospel to, the, to Jerusalem. Peter is there as the gospel goes to the Samaritans. And, of course, Peter's the one who's there as the gospel is then taken to the Gentiles for the first time with Cornelius. But it's only the beginnings, really. The, the Acts 1-8 mission to bring it to the end of the earth, it happens especially through, um, through the Apostle Paul. So we call it the Acts of the Apostles, but most of the Apostles aren't mentioned. Right? Um, it's mainly about Peter, Peter and Paul. Uh, and Paul's conversion gets a lot of airtime. Right? One way to 
to work out how important something is, is how many times it's repeated. And of course, Paul, Paul's conversion gets a lot of airtime in the book of Acts. Chapter 9, quite a large section of it, and then chapters 22 and, and, and 26. And of course, as we're getting to 22 and 26, it's, uh, it's not just Paul really on trial, but it's Paul and his gospel and his mission to the nations that's been uh, you know, on trial. They, they, they're climactic passages. They're important passages. And, and Paul's own conversion is a really big uh, and, and important uh, part of that. So that signals that Paul's conversion is very important for understanding um, the theology of, of Acts, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, before going any further here, I think it'd be good to have our exegetical uh, passage. We missed the one last week, so let's do this week's one. And we're going to focus on this particular point uh, and thinking about the conversion of Paul. So if you go to the last, uh, uh, the last page of, uh, of the handout, then you sh there should be a uh, um, exegetical task. And what we're going to look at is uh, Acts chapter 9 and verses 10 to 18. Okay? Acts chapter 9, verses 10 to 18 and we'll do the normal you know the normal questions that we do in terms of uh, you know the, 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 the context the content the big idea uh, the big aim and so on yeah okay let me uh pause the recording and then i'll i'll, I'll put this into place uh, actually actually let me uh, read the passage first yeah before this sorry joseph you have a question uh the exegetical question mm -hmm. is at the end of the uh handout yeah Oh, right. Okay. I must have not saved the PDF properly. Never mind. Uh, I'll put it in the groups and then I'll, I'll resend the handout on the WhatsApp group. Okay. okay. All right. But let's, uh, let's read the passage first and then uh, we'll split off and, and I'll sort that out while you begin discussing. So it's Acts chapter 9, verses 10 to 18. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise, go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. So let's uh, divide into our groups and talk about that passage for about uh, 10 minutes or so. Yeah, hope you had a, had a good discussion on that passage. Now, uh, I was interested to, to see what your observations on that passage were, because this is one of the, the passages that I'm doing my own research on at the moment, right? So I was wanting to, uh, yeah, to see if you could give me any fresh insights that I could. Uh, <laughs> I doubt. <laughs> uh, but my, the, topic that I'm, the topic that I'm looking at is how Paul is portrayed as a further fulfillment of the Isaianic servant. And, um, and uh, so you see a few interesting things here. So for example, this, this verse 15 and 16 is obviously very important for uh, understanding Paul's mission, right? This is this is what he's commissioned to do by the, the risen Lord Jesus. Yeah. Um, he's a he's a chosen instrument of mine. And that language of of, of chosen is something that comes from uh, 
from the servant. Uh, if so, if you remember in Isaiah 42, verse uh, one, uh, behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I put my spirit upon him. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. And here is uh, Paul, who's described as God's uh, my, my chosen instrument. Um, he receives uh, the spirit here. Uh, and he's to carry uh, Jesus' name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now, of course, this is looking forward to how the book of Acts is going to end, you know, as, as uh, Paul is going to be brought before, um, you know, Felix and, and Agrippa and, uh, and, and so on. And, of course, he's going to preach in the synagogues, but he's also going to bring the gospel, gospel to the nations as well. And... Uh, I think behind this verse is Isaiah 49, verse 6, which is about the servant again. It's to light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I'll make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. We've already seen that this is a key verse because this ends of the earth language here is echoing Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 8. And an interesting thing about the servant is that part of his ministry is before kings, right? So... Uh, in verse, the final servant song, um, Isaiah 53, it starts at the end of chapter 52, and it says, So he shall sprinkle many nations, kings shall shut their mouths because of him, that which has not been told them they see, that which they have not heard they understand. So, you know, is that a reference to um, the servant as well? And then, of course, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of of, of my name and we know the Isaiah servant is the suffering servant it's through his suffering that he achieves his uh, achieves his his mission and so on so yeah this is what I'm this is what I'm thinking about is is why why does Luke portray Paul in this uh, in this way uh, and what's the significance of that for understanding the book of Acts the, the purpose of the book of Acts the theology of the book of Acts now, I think this understanding of Paul is, is confirmed as we go across to, to chapter 13. And remember, Paul doesn't uh, uh, start his ministry really straight away. Uh, at the end of this chapter, there's kind of initial fulfillment. He goes and preaches that Jesus is the son of God. Uh, and then uh, he suffers as a result, right? And he has to um, escape because there's a, a, a plot to kill him. So, you know, immediately... Um, the commission is being lived out, but he only begins his missionary journeys, of course, in chapter 13, and this is one we've looked at uh, already tonight. Uh, he ends up in, uh, in in Antioch. He preaches there, and and we're seeing at the right at the end of this uh, this long sermon in the synagogue, uh, he is rejected by re rejected by the Jews. Let's pick it up from verse 45. When the Jews saw the crowds. They were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be first spoken to you, to you Jews, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. Here's the us here. Uh, surely this is uh, Paul, Paul and Barnabas. Right? Uh, so the Lord has commanded us, so if the us is Paul and Barnabas, then who's the Lord? I take it it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This is the verse we just looked at from Isaiah 49 and verse 6. So the servant, his mission was first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, and that seems to explain Paul's pattern. Whenever he goes to a town, he goes first to the Jews. He goes to the synagogue or wherever the Jews are going to hang out, and only when they reject it, then he goes to the Gentiles because the servant's mission was, yes, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth, but uh, ultimately it also included um, uh, restoring Israel as well. So what does this mean then? Because we all know, I guess, that Jesus is the suffering servant. And um, he's, he's, that, that, that's said explicitly in both Luke and Acts. 
remember Philip, the, the Ethiopian eunuch, what's he reading in Acts chapter 8? He's reading Isaiah chapter 53 okay? uh, in his, uh, in his uh, chariot. So I wouldn't mean to go to Acts chapter 8 here. So the Ethiopian eunuch here, he's reading uh, Isaiah 53. And, and, and he asked, who's this talking about? And we're told Philip opened his mouth and began with this, this scripture. He told them the good news about Jesus. Right? So the book of Acts is quite clear that Jesus is the suffering servant. Jesus is the one who dies on the cross for the sins of the world. But remember the, that uh, there's two stages to the plan in Luke 24. The first stage, that Christ must suffer and be raised. And then the second stage, repentance for the forgiveness of sins must be proclaimed in his name to all nations. So, and what we see in the book of Acts is that Jesus is the servant. He's the one who's bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. But he does it through his witnesses, isn't it? That's what we see in Acts chapter 1. He says, you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And then Jesus ascends to heaven. He pours out his spirit and, he, and, and Jesus is at work through his spirit and so on, making sure the gospel goes to the nations. He's doing it through his people. We see something like that in, uh, in, in, in Acts chapter 9 as well. Remember the context at the start of this, of this chapter. Uh, Jesus appears to Saul and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's interesting how Jesus talks here, isn't it? Because uh, Saul has been persecuting Christians. He hasn't, and Jesus is in heaven. Um, but you, you see Jesus identifying with his people. Right? And so as Saul persecutes Christians, he's persecuting Jesus because they are his body. They are his they are, they are his people, yeah. And, and so in a similar way, Jesus is the servant, but he's achieving his servant mission through his, through his people and, uh, and, and supremely through the apostle um, Paul. And so how does the gospel advance through Paul? Through preaching, yes. Through suffering, yes because that's how it happens with Jesus. And you get, end up with this really interesting thing as we get to the, uh, to the end of the book of Acts, where in many ways, uh, what's happening to Paul mirrors what happens to Jesus. So you have Jesus on a journey to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to suffer. You have, you have Paul on a journey uh, to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to suffer, but he goes there anyway. And there's all the trial scenes. Of course, remember, Jesus has multiple trials. Paul has multiple trials um, and so on. There's, a, there's, many, there's many ways. Now, of course, they're not exactly the same. Jesus gets executed um, and, and Paul doesn't. You know, Paul ends up in, in Rome and so on. But there's this similarities um, that, 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 you, that you see between, between the two. So anyway, that's uh, that. That's what I'm looking at in terms of my my own research. And if you're interested, you can, you know, when I, whenever I finish, I can send it to you. But I think the uh, it's a it's an important point for thinking about what Acts is about because Paul is such an important character in Acts. He dominates more than half the book. His conversions, so, I mean, his commissioning uh, conversion narrative is so important because it takes up three chapters. Out of, out, out of the 28. So it's really important in thinking about how to understand Paul's missionary journeys, et cetera, and ultimately what's the point of, 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 of the book. Okay, so I think let's, uh, any questions you wanna ask there? Otherwise we can move on. Okay, so uh, got a few more themes. Let's just go through this quite quickly by looking at the, the outline itself, right? So. God and his plan. God's plan is a big theme in the book of Acts. Acts continues the theme of the fulfillment of prophecy, showing how the promises of the Old Testament are fulfilled in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the preaching of the nations of the salvation he has accomplished. So David Peterson writes, 
God makes known his powerful presence and purpose in the narrative of Acts by direct action and speech through angelic or human messengers, with the latter regularly using scripture to proclaim the character and the will of God. So in other words, we get a strong sense as we work through Acts that everything is progressing as God intends. God is directing things. God is making sure uh, things happen as, as, as he wants. Maybe a very good example of this would be the uh, Macedonian Paul um, in Acts chapter 16, uh, verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, In other words, you see God as an active agent in the book of Acts. The Lord Jesus is actively directing things through his spirit to achieve his, his, his plan. Right? And uh, sometimes, it, as, as we see in this passage, there's, there's, there's a vision and, and, and various things. Uh, other times, it's, it's, it's not spectacular like that. But uh, other times, it's just uh, we see the, the scriptures being fulfilled, things playing out according to what the Old Testament mm -hmm. says. And this is, this is partly what we see in the various, various speeches, uh, as we see the various sermons that are scattered through Acts. Usually, very often what they're doing is they're showing how Jesus comes in fulfillment uh, of, uh, of the Old Testament. So in Acts chapter 2, we have... Peter quoting from Joel 2, Psalm 16, 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 110, plus other passages. Acts chapter 3, um, the preaching is, is grounded in uh, the promises in Genesis 12. Acts chapter 7, which is Stephen's, Stephen's uh, speech, and he does a kind of Bible overview, which presents Christ as the, the climax, the culmination of the Old Testament. Uh, Acts chapter 13, uh, which is uh, Peter, Paul preaching in Antioch. Um, again, we have uh, Jesus coming in fulfillment of the Old Testament story with specific passages like Psalm 2, Isaiah 55, Psalm 62, Samuel 7, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, and so on, right? So Peterson writes, Peter and Paul focus on the particular significance of David in the unfolding plan of God, both with, with respect... I'm going to speech, the screen. Oh, it's, no, you can't see it. Okay, sorry. Can you see it now? Yeah, I'm reading this quote here. Uh, Peter and Paul focus on the particular significance of David in the unfolding plan of God, both with respect to his appointment as king of Israel and his prophetic role pointing to Jesus and the gospel events. But the revelation of God's eschatological will and purpose comes more broadly through Moses and the prophets, through these divine messages, the different dimensions and full extent of the plan of salvation is made known and regularly expounded by Christian preachers in Luke's narrative. Uh, and so Peterson concludes, according to Squire, the overall function of Luke's interpretation of events within the framework of the divine plan is to offer encouragement to his readers as they live out their faith in a post-apostolic situation to offer them a theological grounding for their missionary activity. It's an integral part of the divine plan. Present ways by which potential criticisms can be defended by respectable means using the language of historians who depicted history in this fashion. So, in other words, uh, Luke is regularly presenting everything that's going on as the fulfillment of God's plan. God's plan that is promised in in the old testament scriptures so you see that in the speeches as they show how jesus fulfills the speeches but we also see it even as we just saw with the apostle paul as he goes about his suffering mission to the nations etc 
it's not random that he's doing this. It, it, it's, it's happening in fulfillment of a passage like Isaiah 49, um, 6, and so on. So it's to give us confidence that, you know, Christianity is not just some, you know, revolutionary, you know, idea that's spreading through the ancient world. Well, this is, this is the plan of God. This is the truth. And therefore, with confidence, we can take this message out uh, to the world. Uh, okay, next, uh, next theme we're talking about is Christology. And there's a lot that we could say here. I'm just going to just briefly mention three things. Jesus is described as Lord, Christ, and servant. Uh, and especially in his, in his depiction of Jesus as Lord, uh, he's described in ways that uh, you can see here, in the way that the Old Testament describes transcendent Yahweh as imminently involved with Israel. In other words, Jesus is described in ways that make him sound like God. Uh, he's presented in a divine way. So remember in Acts chapter 2, Peter concludes his sermon. Let all the house of Israel be assured. This Jesus is Lord and Christ. Right? He's Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Lord and Christ. Now remember, Lord, that is God's name in the old testament is god reveals himself at the burning bush he reveals himself as as uh, yahweh i am who i am and remember in the old testament the israelites didn't like to pronounce god's name yahweh so everywhere where god's name yahweh appears they replaced it with or they just pronounced it um, the word lord adonai um and and this is reflected in our in our Bible translations, where we find Lord in the Old Testament, then we find it in uh, all all capital uh, let in a small caps. Yeah. Uh, so let's just look at an, uh, an example of this from from Acts chapter two. And so here's 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 Peter. Peter preaching, and the, of course, the climax of this quotation of Joel, Joel, uh, is it shall come to pass everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if we go back and look that up in its uh, original context here, uh, we will find that that's actually God's God's name, right? So, uh, can you see? You can see my screen, right? It's, just make sure. So Joel chapter two here, you can see it's the same, you know, it's the same quotation here. But it's the great and awesome day of the Lord, all caps, shall come to pass everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, all caps, uh, shall be saved. But of course, once we get to the, basically the point of Peter's sermon is that the Lord on whom you need to call upon is the Lord Jesus Christ, hence the, the conclusion of the sermon. God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have, um, you have crucified. And so it's quite impossible here to not um, see the, you know, the divine connotations here in calling Jesus Lord. We just looked at Acts chapter 9, where we have uh, uh, Paul's conversion here. And he says, so, so why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? Right. So in the Old Testament, we're used to this idea of a theophany, right? of God revealing himself um, to, you know, to someone, like he reveals himself to Moses at the burning bush or something like this. Uh, we've got various episodes like that in in the old testament but this is not a, a you know it's not a theophany this is a christophany it's a it's a revelation of of christ but he's being presented like he's the lord of the old testament isn't it and in fact that word lord it, it persists all, all throughout this this chapter it's easier to gloss over it but um the lord said uh, it, yeah the lord appears to ananias in a vision 
Uh, and then um, the Lord said to him, go for he is, he is my chosen instrument. And then laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight. So the Lord that's being referred to all throughout the chapters is it's not, uh, you know, God the Father or something like that. It's the, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and so this title, Lord, Lord, for, uh, Lord in, uh, in, in Acts, it's impossible, I think, not to see the, the, the divine connotations um, of it. Jesus is the divine uh, Lord right, who is ruling and, and directing and saving and who is sovereign and, um, and, 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 and all, of, all of those things. Yeah. So let's just pick up Peterson's uh, quotation here. Thus, many passages focusing on the messiahship of Jesus imply that he is a divine figure. So that's uh, that, that's Christology. Let's move on to the next uh, next topic, uh, salvation. And again, salvation is a very uh, central concept in uh, in Luke Acts. Uh, it, it appears many, many, many times uh, throughout the book. And throughout both books and I, I take it that uh, the reason partly the, the reason for that is because Luke is drawing on um, Isaiah again and remember in in Isaiah this idea of, of salvation is very prominent if we were to go back to Isaiah 49 um, 6 again then uh, we would see that talking about the servant it's too light a thing you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of jacob and bring back the preserved of israel i will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends um, of of the earth uh, and and this idea of of salvation here it's 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 very often linked to the idea of uh forgiveness uh, one place we would see that is say earlier on in in, in Luke's gospel, as, uh, as Zechariah uh, has his uh, has his song in Luke chapter chapter one, he's talking about John the Baptist here. You child will be called the prophet of the Most High. You go before the Lord to prepare His way. Notice the allusion there to Isaiah forty, to give knowledge of salvation to His people in the forgiveness of their sins. So salvation comes through having your sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. and, and so Jesus is regularly described as the savior. Um, you might think at this point of Luke chapter two, um, and you was born this day in the city of David, a savior um, who is Christ the Lord. And Peter calls him savior in, in, in Acts and, and Paul calls Jesus savior in Acts, and, and it's quite clear that Jesus, it's through Jesus that salvation is made available to all people. Um, another kind of key verse along these lines, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is, uh, Peter preaches, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved um, salvation is only found in turning to the lord jesus even here this is a this is taking us back to acts chapter 2 as so much of the book of acts does keeps coming back to acts chapter 2 and we've already seen here that peter explaining that the day of the lord has it has arrived and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So salvation comes from turning to the Lord in, in, in forgiveness. And so the Lord Jesus is preached by Peter. He calls on them to respond, repent and be baptized and receive the spirit. And, and interesting how the chapter ends with many other words, he bore witness and continue to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked uh, generation so how do you save yourself by admitting your sins 
repenting and turning to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. So salvation comes by turning to Jesus and receiving the forgiveness that he offers you, that he's made available um, through his um, through his death and resurrection. And because of verses like Isaiah 49, 6, it's the will of God, it's the plan of God that this salvation may be preached to the to the ends of, of, of the earth. And that's and that's what we see happening uh, in, in the book of Acts. So a couple of other points we can add on here. Uh, so let's let's read them one by one. Uh, salvation is strongly linked to forgiveness. Jesus is often described as Savior who brings this forgiveness. Uh, the need for eschatological salvation is first emphasized in Acts 2. Let's look at that. Rescue from divine judgment on sin is needed by turning in repentance to Christ as Savior and King. We've just seen that. The Spirit is given to confirm the reception of salvation. In Luke's way of thinking, salvation in the fuller and more spiritual sense comes about because of Christ's death and resurrection, and the means of receiving the benefits of these climactic events is through the Holy Spirit, who is not sent before Pentecost to be and convey God's soteriological blessing. This means uh, salvation. The salvation that Luke describes is not something that humans can attain for themselves. Uh, it's the gift of God. Um, here, uh, Peterson is... is bringing our attention to Acts chapter 15. Uh, and remember the, the, the issue in Acts chapter 15, this is the, the Jerusalem council, and you've got, uh, you've got some people saying there that uh, in order to be saved, for the Gentiles to be saved, they must first become Jews. So unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then in verse uh, 5 here, some who... Believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said it's necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. So this, you see what they're saying here, these uh, Jewish uh, Christians. They're saying for the Gentiles to be saved, they must first become Jews and express that by receiving circumcision. And uh, thankfully, the Jerusalem Council, as the Spirit of God works among them, listen to what Peter says. We believe, but we believe we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Not saved by works, not saved by uh, religious acts like circumcision or, or, or things like that, but salvation by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. And uh, Jews and Gentiles are on equal stand coming to Jesus together for, uh, for, uh, for forgiveness. Uh, and, and then we've seen that this is therefore uh, salvation is available to all. It's not just for Jews, it's for all the nations. And we're nearly there and we've just a couple more points to go. So obviously opposition and suffering is a big theme here. And there's opposition that comes from different Levels is there's, there's, there's reasons given given for the suffering. Uh, we have opposition to to Christ Himself, and we saw Saul persecuting Christians is actually persecuting Jesus. Uh, we have we have uh, opposition from jealous Jews, and they are the you can see here they are the main protagonists really in the Book of Acts. O occasionally, there is opposition from Gentiles too, so it's not exclusively. Jewish opposition to the gospel, but it is primarily and often where the opposition comes from the Gentiles, it was stirred up by the Jews in the first place. Um, there is opposition from worldly authorities, and we've seen Herod killing, uh, killing James, putting Peter in prison, and um, certainly at the end, uh, the trials of, of, of Paul. So there's, um, there is opposition from, uh, from the Roman authorities as well, and sometimes even, uh, even from you know, so-called believers as well. But people like Ananias and Sapphira, um, you know, Simon trying to, to buy the gift and, and various other things like that as well. It's false teachers coming up within the church. So there's there's a lot of suffering. You can see there's many, many verses there related to suffering. And, and that's a big theme in Acts. And yet the word of God progresses despite all of, all of this suffering. Uh, we could talk about the church and... Uh, the church presented as the new Israel, 
that's the point of having the 12th apostle appointed in, in Acts chapter 1. Uh, we have the, the church presented as the new Israel, I mean, the new temple, uh, and that's the idea of the spirit being being uh, poured out and living among believers. It's a sense in which believers are being presented as the new temple of God in which God God's presence dwells. Remember in the Old Testament, God's presence dwells in the temple. But now God is, God's presence is dwelling in believers right, by his um, spirit. We've got the church as the body of Christ, as we've just seen. So why are you persecuting me? Jesus identifying with his, his people, uh, the church being the multinational people of God. So it's people from you know all nations uh, is, is included. And it's the precious church of God. Acts chapter 20 talks about it being the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Um, it's God's church. It's not our church. The church doesn't belong to the leaders of the church. It belongs to Jesus who died for the church. Right? Uh, and then the final point we have here is the speeches in Acts. And uh, the key here is really the uh, um, the table, which is meant to be at the end of the outline, but for some reason has been chopped off. Let me share my own leader's notes so you can see the table. Uh, this one. Okay. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to look at the various uh, speeches in Acts and to see... Uh, um, who who preaches the gospel and what they include. And you can see the table here. A, this is who, you know, where is the, where's the speech, who's being preached to, who's doing it, where are they doing it, et cetera, right? Um, but here, this is what, what is included. Creation, the nation, sin, the resurrection of Jesus, witnesses to the resurrection, the lordship of Christ, salvation, the future, the call, call for response, the result of the response, the Holy Spirit, the death of Jesus, the fulfillment of the Old Testament. What do you notice here as you look at this? Well, uh, some elements are there more than others. Creation doesn't come up a whole lot of times. The death of Jesus is there quite a lot of the times, but not in every single speech, which is slightly surprising. Um, but what's the one that is there basically every time? It's... You see, it's this one here, the, the lordship of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. And I think this is the point that we've, uh, um, that, that we've, we've, we've made earlier. What is the gospel that's preached? It's supremely the gospel about the resurrected Lord. Yes, the Lord who died to save us, yes. But the resurrected, um, the resurrected Lord. Okay, I, I think that's that's enough. I hope that gives you something to... Uh, to, to chew on as you continue to study the book of Acts. And, you know, this is just a survey subject. It's an introduction. Uh, I, I hope you'll get plenty of opportunity to, to, to really dig into the book of Acts and hopefully preach through it or do it in Bible studies um, in, in, in the years ahead. It'll be a great encouragement, for sure, um, to your people because it's not just a story about how the gospel went to the nations. I hope you can see it's a book that is full of theology as well that teaches us about god and his ways and his will for our lives well let me lead us in prayer and uh, then uh, we can spend a bit of time to uh, share with each other what we've uh, learned from the cross. Yeah. let's pray together our heavenly father we want to thank you for your grace that you have poured out upon us lord we know we are sinners we know that we are not worthy um, to be part of your kingdom. So we thank you, Lord, for sending people to preach the gospel to us. We thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit to give us new birth. That we, will, that we may indeed re repent and submit to Jesus as our Lord. We thank you for the transformation that he, he brings in our lives. We thank you for the power that your spirit gives us to boldly proclaim the gospel. And indeed, as we come to the end of, of this course, Lord, we pray that you would be sending us out, that we would be bold witnesses uh, for Jesus wherever you would send us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to embrace um, whatever opposition or suffering we may face as we, as we speak of Jesus, because we know that even though some will reject, that those that you have appointed 
will be met. And so, Lord, we, we pray that in your grace you would use us to see many more people um, come to um, trust in Jesus and receive eternal life. So, Lord, we thank you for uh, your Spirit's work among us um, in these classes, and uh, we thank you for your, your, your grace to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.